Right, uh, welcome to the final of our uh, Understanding Taiwan through film and documentary uh, film series. This is film uh, number 10, and it's the fifth film of uh, our first ever uh, Taiwan Film Week. Um, I'm delighted to see so many of you here on such an awful day in terms of weather, and of course on, on Valentine's Day. I'm glad that uh, when I was doing the, um, the advertising, I mentioned it as, as a, um, our Valentine's Day uh, screening. Um, let me just say a few words about what we're trying to do in this, this um, uh, film series. We're, we're trying to um, uh, link um, Taiwanese film to the kind of courses that we, um, uh, that we have on Taiwan here at SOAS. So we, we, we're trying to look at a number of themes like national identity, social change, nationalism, Taiwan-China uh, relations, and, and um, Taiwan's modern history and its historical relationship with Japan uh, and, and China. And that's the kind of themes that have kind of overlapped with many of the, uh, the films that we've looked at, both this week uh, and, uh, and last term. Uh, today's film uh, is really looking at social change. It's, it's a film set in Penghu and Kaohsiung in the, um, uh, in the 1980s. And it's one of my favorite uh, Ho Xiaoxian uh, films. Um, I, I particularly like his, his early films, perhaps because I first went to Taiwan in the 1980s. I've got a special soft spot for that, that period. Um, today, uh, we, I'm delighted to welcome, uh, welcome Minya Ronsley, who's our, our research associate here, although she lives in uh, the far west of, uh, of Wales. So it takes us something like six hours to, to get here to, to London. Um, Minya is, has been a very prolific uh, publisher in a number of fields in Taiwan studies, uh, on Taiwan's uh, media, particularly public television, uh, Taiwan film, um, and democratization. Um, and she's going to give a short introduction um, uh, to the film, and then we'll do the screening and have a, a Q&A uh, at the end. Um, the other thing I should say about uh, Mia is that uh, she's the Secretary General of the European Association of, uh, of Taiwan, and she's been working very hard to promote Taiwan studies uh, beyond uh, the, the UK. OK, so over to you, Mia. Thank you very much, David. And it was really very pleasing to see so many people come to see a film. Um, you know, like David <laughs> said, on a such awful night. Um, I will keep my talk short. The aim of the Taiwan Film Week in SOAS is to help audiences understand Taiwan through films. And Boys from Feng Gui is a fictional feature film. So it is quite problematic for me to try to make a claim that we can or should to learn certain facts about Taiwan by watching this film. In fact, I think perhaps it is more important, or at least equally important uh, to the aim of the project, that if we can actually create an environment where the audiences can watch the film without too much baggage or too many presumptions and simply enjoy the viewing experience. Therefore, in this pre-screening talk, I will try not to give too much away about the story of the film, but I will situate the film within a broader context of Taiwan history and the history of Taiwan cinema by making two bold statements. Um, after the screening, upon quick reflection, uh, you may find you yourself agree with or wish to challenge my statements. In this way, I hope we can establish an interesting, if not good, basis for discussion during the Q&A session. Moreover, as actually in this audience, we have people who know about filmmaking in Taiwan. Um, sorry, I should have delete this. You know, originally director Zhong Chen is going to be here with us, but then he had an engagement, so he left early. <coughs> Never mind, but there are actually other film and cultural scholars who are very familiar with Taiwan cinema and culture, such as Professor Chris Berry, who just appeared and made me very nervous, and also oh. <laughs> Professor Sang Zilan is here. Mm. And we also have scholars who are extremely knowledgeable about Taiwan politics, such as uh, Professor Daphne Fell. So I'm sure their input will further strengthen the depth of our discussion, especially if there are any questions that I am unqualified or unable to answer. So here goes my two statements. Right, first, 
I will claim that Boys from Feng Gui is an early classic of Taiwan new cinema, which is the most important film movement in Taiwan to date. The movement of Taiwan new cinema occurred between 1982 and 1987, which coincided with Taiwan's political democratization and social liberalization. I think it's more accurate to say that Taiwan new cinema, um, yeah, to see Taiwan new cinema as culturally instead of a politically motivated movement. However, the movement does generate some political consequences. For example, the abolishment of policies which restrict the use of local languages in Taiwan cinema, and also the creation of a discourse about Taiwan's national cinema. Second, one of the key questions that Taiwan new cinema endeavored to address was the search for a new cinematic form, a new type of films and filmmaking that allows the filmmakers truer reflection on their own experiences and feelings. Hou Xiaoxian is one of the most important filmmakers of Taiwan New Cinema. In his earlier works, during the period of Taiwan New Cinema, he developed a unique autobiographical or sometimes just biographical approach to filmmaking. However, even though the themes of Taiwan New Cinema may be personal, it is often read Allegorically, um, uh, allegorically. Hou Xiaoxian's protagonist often becomes an observer in a story. We may see the protagonist's emotions and reactions towards the event, but we do not know what he or she thinks because Hou Xiaoxian deliberately leaves it ambiguous. And this is the beauty of Hou's works. Taiwan New Cinema was the first film movement in Taiwan history when the filmmakers were able to tackle deep and serious questions about Taiwan society and personal identity. However, it does not mean that the filmmakers have obtained an ultimate truth or convincing answers. Hence, in Feng Gui, uh, Boys from Feng Gui and many other host films, such as A City of Sadness, the filmmaker shared with us his observations and his attitude, sometimes very philosophical and empathetic, in accepting <coughs> these observations and allowing them to evolve without placing judgment. And I will say without judgment does not mean being indifferent. Okay, so without further ado, we'll watch the film and then we will have the Q&A afterwards. Thank you. Enjoy the film. Um, so yeah, we'll go straight into it. <laughs> Any questions and comments? Um, I will think actually maybe just you know, sort of a discussion informally. And so if anybody want to make a start, please feel free to do so. Do you like the film? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so I will have questions. You know, so it's a film um, made in 1983 in Taiwan. Um, but even you didn't live in Taiwan during that time. Um, do you feel actually there is some sort of a commonality? Um, why do you like it? Please. I think one of the things I found funny is that there seems to me to be a kind of universal stupidity of young men. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> I don't mean that in a sexist way. I just yes. my own take on it is that there's just a massive level of social and sexual repression, which means that what they should be doing is getting laid and sadly what they are doing is slapping each other around the head a lot of the time. Right. Something else. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something which I suspect is pretty global. Mm -hmm. And that's something I find very funny about the film. Yes. And I was surprised as well at how 80s it looked to me. Mm -hmm. So I think that as well is something that's interesting as a kind of flattening out of global culture, mm. where increasingly things like the same hair things are around the whole planet, irrespective yes. of which country right. or which uh -huh. OK, thank you. Yeah, certainly I think that process of growing up, um, yeah, like you said, you know, the stupidity. And, and, and a lot of time, actually, you couldn't really work out yourself's position with the past with your present, you know, so much to work out. 
and actually also the impending future, you know, for these young men actually obviously going to be the soldier, and um, you know, is uh, in, imposed on them. But how do you face that? But a lot of times you just throw yourself into the moment. Yeah, and, and also actually I think a lot of elements also make me make the link to the few films that we watched um, the day before yesterday. So that a lot of the things, it just make you think culture per se really don't change because actually a lot of the bromance that we talked about a few days ago still coming through. And also, you know, if you want to look at from the gender relationship, you know, the men and women, again, it still seem to, to continue today. It, it hasn't really changed that much in many ways. Um, but that's my own observation in terms of Taiwan society. Yeah, uh, thanks, Minye, for, for uh, choosing uh, this film. I mean, I, I'm someone who lived in Gaoshan for, for, for many years, so it was interesting for me to see what, what had changed and what, what hadn't changed. And it was actually quite more than I expected hadn't changed. Mm -hmm. um, right. the, the one question I had was, um, do you know anything about the what was the audience reaction like to this film back in 1983? Right, okay. Uh, because I can imagine it's quite different from the kind of films that most Taiwanese audiences were used to at that, that point in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this was actually the film that was popular. So there was a time when Taiwanese cinema appeared to be actually financially viable, commercially viable. And so this is one of the popular films. Um, within Taiwan new cinema. And I think in the film there were also some comments, social comments about you know what's going on. So for example, the movies that actually they saw in the film, um, you know, the, the Kung Fu movie, that was actually huge, uh, hugely popular. And that's what uh, audience consumed. Hence, you know, to say Taiwan new cinema earlier when I said about um, this movement actually tried to make a new kind of films that are actually closer to the reality in some way actually to try to against these sort of very formulaic albeit, you know, I think some of them fantastic um, however, it was just sort of very, very formulaic not really related to what's going on in Taiwan So it was actually a commercial success? Yes, Boys from Fu It seems odd to me that you can't buy this film anywhere Right, okay. So in terms of the uh, Taiwan New Cinema's copyright laws, the, the translation of English was quite, quite bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but as long as you can't understand it. Yeah, so I think the copyright is a big issue. Uh, a lot of films during that period, either you couldn't actually get uh, copies with English subtitles, or actually you know it does exist, but you just have nowhere. To, to obtain it. And I know for this particular copy, in fact, we had to get in touch with the Hou Xiaoxian's company and they made a copy for David. <laughs> so, any other comments? You know? Michael, please. Thank you very much. I was in Taipei for the first time about that. Well, maybe I, I don't know how different things are. I didn't know how to come in those days. Mm -hmm. But I imagine there was quite a difference between Taipei and Kaohsiung in the 80s. In the 80s, you think this is, there's a lot of difference between Taipei and Kaohsiung? Um, Shall I repeat to, yeah, to, the, yeah, to what degree the difference? Um, yes, I'm, uh, I can remember the 84, my first mm -hmm. time in Taiwan. Right. Um, I didn't get to the south that year, but I can't help wondering that there was quite a difference between uh, Taipei and Kaohsiung in the 80s. Um, Would you say so? Um, can I understand what you mean by the difference? You know, you think socially, I... socially. You mean people... People were extremely tentative in mm. public in Taipei in those days, for example. Um, also, the... Um, background in the coastal mm. village um, that in turn was also very different from Kaohsiung as, it, as came out in the film. Mm. So there must have been these geographical cultural differences I think around Taiwan. Yes, um, okay. In 1983 I was in Kaohsiung. I didn't go to Taipei until 19... When did I go to Taipei? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I went to Taipei to study, I think it's in 1984, 85. Yeah, so, um, and when I first, I, 
I think the difference to me is subtle. I didn't feel, wow, it was a completely huge city, so different from my life experience. But I think the subtle difference comes from, in Kaohsiung, I, I consider myself a, a, a film fan all my life because of my dad. Um, but the films that I watched um, are the things that you can really access on TV and also in cinema. So I think the biggest shock for me, the, the, the moment actually when I was in university in Taipei, was to realize so many other um, were peers, yeah, so they are about the same peers, also consider themselves as a uh, film fan. But if they live in Taipei, the type of film they accessed was completely out of my reach. So I think that, that would be, to me, the, the largest difference. So they already access, you know, the European cultural films, um, you know, Woody Allen. Um, so yeah, so to me, I just feel I had a lot to catch up. And so I think in terms of the <coughs> cultural resources, uh, sort of an imbalance in Taiwan, this has been talked about for decades. So uh, Taipei, in that sense, is always much more advanced and all the resources sort of uh, available to, you know, uh, to, to the capital. While cit cities outside Taipei, even Kaohsiung was the second largest city, but it doesn't seem to have that um, resources available to them. But in terms of economy, I think you know, in the 1980s, I wouldn't say there was that much different. Although you know, in the 1980s, the Kaohsiung actually we saw on screen was the Kaohsiung that I remembered when I grew up, which is very different from today. Um, so you know, the, the coach, the coach, the bus is, is all, you know, so quickly our, our life have become history because you don't see them. You know, these vehicles don't exist anymore. Um, so yeah, so, so in some way it was quite daunting to realize part of your life already can be in museums and, and it's, it's history, <laughs> you know, modern history. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hello. Um, several of the women Right. I I may be wrong, but my instinct was say actually in terms is less of a class conscious movement. I think actually it's more of a self discovery and self disclosure. And so a lot is to do with whatever the filmmakers or the writer, the script writers, their friends, um, their common experience. Um, but in terms of the uh, the, the music, that's an interesting point. Li Zhongsheng was very popular in Taiwan at the time. I know he came from Hong Kong and studied in, 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 in Taiwan and then actually become a, a big pop star. I don't know why uh, Hou Xiaotian chose Li Zhongsheng's music uh, instead of a local Taiwanese, but that actually could be, could be to do with Hou Xiaotian's own music taste. I don't know. So, so this is really just I... I suspect, and in terms of the the layer of the movie, I think he used in terms of the, the uh, you know the visual, the story, uh, and the the sound. 
often I think it was not necessarily directly talk to each other, hence actually create that complexity. So while the story, you know, perhaps it was a very tense emotionally, a very tense emotion of uh, A Qing's character. How it was, the music was very smooth. And, and that actually does create that kind of ambivalence because it's not necessarily try to to build up his tension and, and see he's going to burst out of crying, crying. And I think to me it's always because to do with he ha is has so much to work through about his true feelings about things, and 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 often you don't necessarily have that uh, leisure of working things out at your own pace because there are just so many other external factors have to push you to make a particular decision. Um, I know that slightly go outside to what you you, you asking about the, the, the choice of music, but the, the truth is I don't know. But I don't know if anybody <laughs> can enlighten us, you know, if you have any. Ding, ding, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Um, I, I want to say that uh, the funniest part for me was they paid 900 pounds to watch a widescreen cover. <laughs> <laughs> yes. and its meaning on the social development and social mm. changes can be applied to mainland China. Mm. And I've got, also got a very short question about the main actor, Niu Chenzhe. Mm. How do you uh, think uh, he's acting? Because <laughs> I, I, I ask this because um, Ho Xiaoxian is the director and he chose Niu Chenzhe as the main actor. Mm. But I remember several years ago when Niu Chenzhe directed Monga, Mm. and acted himself, mm. his acting was, you know, criticized by Hu Xiaoxian. <laughs> 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 My personal uh, interpretation, you know, how I see the acting itself. I, I often, you know, to be honest, I, I always tell people that I don't have taste. I, I, I'm not very picky about many things. <laughs> um, I, I think it was as natural as it can be. So in fact, I think it was, hence actually, I think you know for this film itself, um, you know, so his reaction, that facing the camera, I mm -hmm. think is often his audience or reading about how he's really feeling. Mm -hmm. He was just staring in the camera mm -hmm. to be filmed. Um, but yeah, so for for this film itself, actually, I don't have a lot. I think it's okay. I I don't know. You know, mm -hmm. how how do you feel about his work? <laughs> Um, the brother-in-law is Hou Xiaolian, Hou Xiaoxian himself. Mm. Uh, um, so what do you think about his acting? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think it was just quite natural, mm. um, you know, fitting with the role, with the story. Mm. Um, it was not, it's, it's, it's very much like, a, you know, how life actually developed. So it wasn't a, a lot of dramatic twists and turns, hence, at the same time, it doesn't require. Perhaps actually, when you overreact, overacting can be actually a problem for films mm. of this nature. Mm. Yeah, because it wasn't try to tell you a particular Im things. Mm. You know, you know how how much he loved this girl and how much he's frustrated, mm. or actually how much he regret he didn't tell his dad he loved his dad. In fact, I think his relation with his dad is actually, again, very ambiguous. We know actually there's some deep emotions, but we don't know the emotion. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, when you are not really so sure about how you interpret that emotion, how do you act it to be convincing? Mm -hmm. So perhaps actually l less acting is 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 better choice, mm -hmm. because then the audience can can make its own interpretations mm -hmm. for films like this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, I'm curious about something. Um, I've only I've only ever been to uh, Taiwan uh, in recent years, and, not, and never Kaohsiung. And obviously, it's totally different to what I saw there. Like if I was to watch a British film set in the 1980s, it would mm. essentially be 
the same Britain that we see now. Mm. And that, like to me, was was more like uh, Philippines, how mm. I uh, how I imagined mm. Thailand to be, mm. Mm. and what I experienced of Taiwan when I was living there. So I was wondering when a Taiwanese person watches that now, a younger Taiwanese person around mm. my age or younger, mm. do they also do they feel that it's their home and their culture, or are they mm. also, or mm. is it also a totally different world to them? Like right, that's things? interesting. Yeah. Um, my again, I would just say ah, they should feel the same, but I don't know. You know, do we have a younger generation Taiwanese here? Maybe you can tell us. Do you feel this in Taiwan? You feel familiar with and you recognize, or how do you see it? <coughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for choosing the film. Um, mm. I represent the Taiwanese Fellowship. We have a group, large group of people here. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I have two uh, points that I want to solicit your uh, questions earlier about the music. Um, I used to live in France, mm -hmm. um, and in Paris, uh, we often like to, um, you see, that broadcast some Taiwanese film that's quite popular. Mm -hmm. um, and from my understanding about the music, uh, that in this particular in this film, that seems there's some influences by the new wave. Uh, new wave. Mm -hmm. Am I right? <laughs> um, and the use of the music actually, I think, maybe is an option from Hoda, mm -hmm. the director, mm -hmm. uh, because we know originally from full season, Divadi. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Mm -hmm. If I'm wrong, please correct me. And I found it as a very interesting observation is um, whenever there's a big uh, interruption of changes in life, you will see the classic music mm. accompanying with the film. Mm. It's sort of, I think, sort of uh, Holdout's philosophy of life. <laughs> 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 or a lot of people will share that view that our life is like four seasons, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you will see that um, uh, the second point about how young generation thought of the, you know, how the comparing, I'm actually from Kaohsiung. Oh, oh. <laughs> so um, by that time, I possibly just born. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I can tell you that um, I, I found in the south part of Taiwan, there's not actually, you cannot tell the uh, bourgeoisie, uh, how we can pronounce that. Yeah, really. You know, the middle, middle class, middle class mm -hmm. or working class, you couldn't really tell actually. Mm -hmm. um, because, um, of course, they are sort of fashionable mm -hmm. because in the south, uh, people, they, the local culture, don't like to represent self, which class it comes from. Okay, they just like to be casual. Mm -hmm. And for the you see that open markets and how we cut the fish in the court. Mm -hmm. I we can still see that nowadays. Of course that's really? a very new building. That's why I love Gaoshong that the originality of the south of Taiwan. Uh, but I've been away from Taiwan for many, many years now, and uh, I can see the big changes, mostly in Taipei. And uh, Kaohsiung has some changes, but they are more green. Sorry, it's, it mm. sounds like I promote a little bit Kaohsiung, but <laughs> I really love that. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. When do we have to finish? Uh, let's take some Oh, something else. Mm. Well, let's take one more question, then we should okay. finish. Right, okay. So, <laughs> Now we haven't really talked about the difference between Feng Gui, you know, Peng Hu and Kaohsiung because mm. Kaohsiung in the film actually represents the city. Yes. And these boys are originally from uh, this, these small yes. islands yes. that are Absolutely. actually not mm. part of the main island of Taiwan. Mm. So I think the contrast there is a very much a rural versus urban Ooh. contrast. So it's not just uh, a class issue, it's also geographic difference, cultural mm. difference mm. within Tai uh, I mean Taiwan mm. and uh, the, the island the small islands, offshore islands. So that's one point I wanted to make. And mm. then um, I think uh I mean Kaohsiung as a city of course is different from Taipei because at, at that point in time 
there was a lot of industry, right? In in the film, there are the factories, um, and then uh, the boyfriend of the girl that mm -hmm. Ati likes, he's uh, he's uh, let's see, he, he's become a sailor, right? Yes, he's gone to sea. Mm -hmm. So there there are all these fishing industries and also the factories, etc. So. Gaoshan's economy at that point was very, very vibrant. That's right. Right. Yes. Um, but since then, uh, in terms of the volume of uh, yeah, the, that's the, gone the port. the port, yes. then mm -hmm. it has declined. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. So there's a big difference, but we don't really see that in the film. But if, no. at that point, I think Gaoshan represent this very vibrant port city that was really, really important in uh, at least in Asian <coughs> economy. Mm -hmm. So. That's the second point. <laughs> and I wanted to just uh, say something about Yo Chang, Yo Chang does uh, acting. I think it's fabulous, actually. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, even though he may not, uh, he, he's not really dramatic, I think the, the, the repression they feel in his body language and his facial expression, that was all very, very appropriate for this role. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, oh, did you want to take one last question then? Oh, oh yeah. I, oh. I know, you know, I see the hand for oh, quite a while. Oh, the so guy at the back? Think, yes, Okay, please. yes. <laughs> so that would be the final he's, comment. Yeah, he's been yeah. to quite a few of the films. All right, oh, okay. about music I didn't really understand it because obviously he's a he's a great filmmaker and the music worked you know whether it was local Taiwanese music or what yes. and I think possibly he had some influence as well from I've seen a film by uh, Pier Paolo Pasolini Italian neorealist film and he, he uses one of the films I think it's called Akitoni he does a similar the music's very similar mm. And it's just those kind of long panning shots. Mm. But I really, I really found it moving. I, felt, I really yes. got a sense mm. of the, mm. he was trying to, to show the impermanence, you know, the impermanence mm. of everything, you know, mm. nothing, nothing lasts. And it, I think it came, I missed the beginning, so I can't mm -hmm. really judge the whole film, but mm. just seeing that, yes. I, I, I think it was good. By the way, that film was uh, Drunken Master, the, the Kung Fu. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, I yes. think it was Drunken Master. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. I saw it at Christmas. Very, very few. See you again. Okay. 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 Let me just say a few words of thanks. Okay. So, can we give um, um, Mingya a, a round of applause? Let me just say a few words of thanks to um, people that have made this, uh, this film series and particularly this, this week possible. Firstly, of course, we've got to thank the Ministry of Culture for their um, uh, support. Um, secondly, of course, I've got to thank those uh, directors and film scholars that have come, uh, Ming Ye, um, uh, Sang Zelan, and also uh, Zhong Quan, who showed three of uh, uh, his films. Um, the next person I've got to thank is Zhang Biyu, who, who chaired the sessions Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and did a uh, simultaneous translation for, for Zhong Quan. She did an amazing job. Um, I've also got to thank um, my um, support team, uh, uh, Nikki Oldsford, who did the um, uh, pub, uh, publicity, the posters, for example. A lot of those uh, harassing emails were from, from either me or, or Nikki. Um, uh, Jewel Law, who's, who's been doing the, uh, the website, the, uh, the Facebook. Um, is there anyone else I should have, I should thank? Oh yeah, I've got to thank um, uh, Pablo for giving us a, wo a wonderful kind of catering uh, idea. Um, and oh, another one who's, who's helped a lot in publicity is uh, Dean, uh, uh, who's been here for all five films. And I think there's quite a few of you who have been here for um, five, four or three films. I want to thank you for coming on bad weather and in, in, in reading week. Mm -hmm. and, and hopefully we'll be um, back. Our next films are planned for late July and Wan Ren is due to uh, come to London. So we'll, this will be, hopefully this will be the start of um, a lot of wonderful Taiwanese documentaries and films. So once again, thanks for all your support. Yeah.